Why did he do that? Unbelievable! Yasir Shah wins the match, wins the series for the first time for Pakistan. <laughs> Poor old Gabriel Fazir. <laughs> Lovely to have you with us. That was just... Well, I, I could listen to that. It's like people saying about me and the Lego rule, I could listen to that forever. I could listen to that forever because the pain, the torture, and yet it's so funny at the same time. <laughs> Indeed, it, it, it is, uh, is Agas. You know, it's it's great to be with you uh, once again. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, this thing has taken a life of its own. Uh, <laughs> as much as uh, I would wish that it didn't happen uh, that way, and, and Paul Shannon Gabriel has to be reminded about it over and over again. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's something that he certainly remember. Has he heard it? Have you talked to him about it? No, I haven't. I'm not brave enough to. Although he's a pretty <laughs> gentle giant, I, I, I would never think of even approaching him. Uh, on, on that particular issue, but uh, I, I understand he took it pretty badly, which is what you could understand. Uh, but uh, as I said, he's he's moved on from that. And I think <laughs> one of these days, when we're two grey grey beards and so on, I'll, I'll probably ask him the question. Uh, maybe after a fantastic spell of bowling, when he's cleaned up somebody, who knows? When next England are in the Caribbean, and then I'll ask him the question. Yeah, well, he's a fellow Trini anyway, isn't he? He is, but that doesn't say a lot, depending on how things how things go. <laughs> because uh, the, the the relationship between uh, commentators, broadcasters, journalists, and players at times isn't always the best. But in fairness to him, he's always been pretty easy going when he's approached. Yeah, sure. What was going through your mind then? I mean, I mentioned the torture and the pain. I mean, it was. If people haven't seen it, it was an utterly appalling shot. I mean, you you set the scene. It was what two balls to go or something to save the game or something ridiculous. It was the, actually the last ball last of ball. penultimate over because it was uh, the last ball to be bowled by Yashdi Shah in the series. And at the other end, you've got Roston Chase on 100. <laughs> so essentially, it was surviving that one delivery and let Roston Chase play out for a draw. And well, we know what happened. He had a massive swipe. <laughs> That's what happened, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it, I suppose uh, you, you've got that instinctive reaction. Why did he do that? <laughs> but then you've got to remember you're, you're a broadcaster for the entire world, not just the Western days. And I think it's about pausing to capture the moment properly and ensure that it doesn't come around as just some jingoistic sort of issue and you're all, all about the Western days and so on. And I think that has always been uh, something that, that I've tried my best to do, whether radio, television, or in writing or whatever it is, more or less taking a, a, a page out of the, the massive book of Tony Cozier yes. and try to be as professional as possible. I wonder what he might have said. <laughs> he would have just have said bold him, would he? <laughs> Probably. And he might have said some, oh, oh my word, or maybe something <laughs> along that line. Maybe far, far more cultured than what, than what I would have offered. Yeah. But you're a colourful you're a colourful nation over there, Fazir. You're very emotional. And the way that's, that everyone in the Caribbean supports and loves cricket, it's, it's good to get a bit of emotion out there. I, I think it is. And I think one of the, the, the good things of being from the Caribbean is, is the contrast. And I think that's the beauty of, of being involved as a broadcaster in different parts of the world or right here in the Caribbean when other nations come visiting. Because you hear the contrast of the voices, not just the accents, but the styles. Uh, that, that it presents uh, a different perspective, different pictures. And, and yes, we're very excitable. We're very noisy. We're, we're up and down, uh, very emotional about things. I, I just think it, it, it adds to the flavor of the entire experience. Because I don't think by any stretch of the imagination, we'd all want everyone to sound the same way, no. uh, whatever part of the world you're, you're in. Yeah. I think if I'd heard that if, with sort of no accent, I think I'd probably have gone for a Caribbean commentator, though, because you do have that passion and you do let yourselves go and you do have that colour that maybe some of us over here are a bit more restrained, perhaps. I don't know. But you, that's the way, it's the way you play your cricket. In, indeed it is. And, and the interesting thing about it is that when I actually first started getting involved in commentary, I was criticised quite a bit for going on too much about mango trees and birds <laughs> and, and Saturday morning markets and, and so on. And I said, well, hang on. When you hear Henry Blofeld going about the red bus going down the Harleford <laughs> Road and say, oh, that's absolutely lovely to hear Henry going on about butterflies and whatever. I say, what about us? So, you know, it's, it's, it's always that, that contrast. And, and indeed, TMS has been the standard for us in the Caribbean for such a long time that you're always measured by that. Sometimes a bit unfairly, but it, that, that just goes with the territory. Yeah, it's a very good point you make. I mean, there is so much colour. 
about watching a cricket match in the Caribbean, isn't it? I mean, at your own Queen's Park. I could, although I've not been there for a while, I seem to have avoided it for some reason, but the candy floss salesman and the fella blowing his conch shell and all of that. I mean, that's such a part. It's a, I mean, it's a wonderful place to commentate. It is. And I, and I think that that really is the luxury we enjoy as commentators, broadcasters in this particular sport. It, it might not be the same for T20 or, or one day internationals because it's all a bit rushed. But when you're in a test match or a first class match and the game is just meandering along, well, you, that, that's it. The, you know, the world is your stage. You, you can talk about everything on the face of the earth. You can talk about the nuts vendors not doing a particularly good trade uh, yes. because there, 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 there aren't many spectators around. You can talk about the, the flavor of the snow cone today is the guava syrup giving you the real flavor of the guava that, that, that you'd like. So it, it is about painting that picture and creating not just the, 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 the image, but the smell and the taste and the sounds you're taking of Caribbean me there. cricket. You're taking me there, the, pump, <laughs> the pumpkin soup. Oh, you do, anyway, you've got me drooling. Um, did, how did you get into it all, Fuzzy? I mean, were, were you were you a cricketer? I tried to be. Uh, I, I grew up in a cricketing family. My, my father uh, was absolutely nuts uh, about the game. And inevitably, I, I grew up in the game because I was a scorer uh, at his club and uh, would be in really following the game intensely from that point onwards. And uh, even though I'm a natural right-hander, I grew up learning the game left-handed, bowling left-handed, batting left-handed, really? because my dad was a natural left-hander. Okay. So it created some pretty weird situations where people would see me chasing after the ball and throwing it in right-handed, <laughs> thinking I was ambidextrous. But it was only because I'm a natural right-hander, but bowled left-handed and so on. But yeah, I, I grew up in the game. I had aspirations, of course, of playing for Trinidad and Tobago at the highest level, hopefully playing for the West Indies. I had my dreams and I had my, my thoughts of, of being the next great left-arm spinner to come out of Trinidad and Tobago. Never happened. I wasn't good enough. I made it into the national under-19 team for the West Indies tournament of 1983 just for one match. Uh, and that was it. And essentially, I potted about a bit as, as far as my academic career I messed up my A-levels, having earlier messed up my O-levels. <laughs> and it, from that point onwards, I think I recognized I wanted to be involved in sport. And that's why, because of my background in the game, I got my first opportunities uh, doing, doing radio commentary when I joined one of the local radio stations. And uh, things developed from that point onwards. Sounds very familiar about the exams failing due to playing cricket and so on. I wonder, do you think you'd have been a better bowler if your if you'd, if you'd dad had let you bowl right arm then? I might have been, but I just don't think I had the instinct uh, to, to really, I, di I didn't have that competitive edge. I didn't have that self-belief. And in fact, as, as we're talking about it, I'm reminded that for, for that first series of 1983, where we played the West Indies Youth Tournament in Jamaica, for the first match against the Windward Islands, I, I wasn't picked in the final 11. And I breathed a sigh of relief, yeah. uh, whereas someone else was left out was bitter about it, about being left out. And I, I, I kind of recognized over the years that I really didn't have that competitive drive that would have seen me be successful. And it's just the way it is. I don't think I, I had what it takes to be a top level international cricketer by any stretch of the imagination. It might make you more of a sympathetic, empathetic commentator, though, the fact that if you have that that frailty, that's what you want to call it, or, or and put that word into your mouth. But you know, if you see, if you see so, uh, somebody struggling under the spotlight, for instance, does it make you a little more sympathetic towards them? Maybe sympathetic and empathetic. I'd like you to tell those two words to Kyron Pollard because I remember oh. uh, him coming to an event of of our. our coaching clinic that we have in my local area here in San Juan in Trinidad. And I gave him this flowery introduction for the benefit of the students and so on. And he, when he stepped up, he said all the things that I would have said about him, very caustic and uncomplimentary as a commentator, he was wondering if it was the same Kyron Pollard <laughs> I was speaking about. So I, I think empathetic would, wouldn't come to mind with, with a lot of West Indies cricketers hearing my commentary. No, no, fair enough. So when was the first one then? You mentioned you slowly got into the, the, the opportunities come along of, of local radio and, and so on. But can, can you remember the, sort of the first proper, you're there in the hot seat and you're actually commentating on a game of cricket for the first time? I remember it perfectly. It was 1992, a regional first class competition, Trinidad and Tobago versus Barbados. Always an intense rivalry. Brian Lara, Phil Simmons, part of the Trinidad and Tobago team. Otis Gibson with Barbados. He took seven wickets on that opening day. Lara scored 100. Phil Simmons scored a half century. 
But interestingly, having begged my sports editor at Radio Trinidad to be given an opportunity to do commentary, I was actually, my very first stint and the first three days involved in the four-day match was as an expert comments man with no experience whatsoever (laughs) because the ball-by-ball positions were already filled. Uh, Reds Pereira, of course, was well known on the international scene and then still does a bit of work. Erskine King from Barbados, who was the visiting commentator, and Dave Lamy uh, from Trinidad and Tobago, who was my sports editor at the time. So the spots were filled. And I, I was there and I was being introduced and people are wondering, who's this guy pretending to be an expert comments <laughs> person? But I, I, I managed well enough. And, and interestingly, I never felt nervous. I never felt anxious. I wasn't sweating profusely because it just seemed so natural mm. to be talking about the game, even if it was now in a proper broadcast format. And, and as fate would have it, on the last day of the match, uh, Reds had to leave early. Reds always has to go to something else somewhere <laughs> in the Caribbean. He's always doing something somewhere else. And I, it actually allowed me the opportunity to fill in for him doing proper ball-by-ball commentary and from, from that point on, Agas, I realised this was what I was born to do. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And you, I, again, I mean, I'd love, I'd love to in the Caribbean, but you're so aware of how many experts there are out there. I'm thinking of how many people would actually think that they were brilliant radio commentators themselves. You hear them doing it, don't you? And so on in the stands. And, and I mean, it's been, you say they you took it very easily, but just to get that opening must have been a, 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 a real bonus, in fact. It was, and I suppose it's about being in the right place at the right time, because now, sadly, uh, radio commentary is is virtually dying in our part of the world, as it has in in many other parts of the world with television taking over. And and you don't really get that opportunity as a young broadcaster anymore to hone your skills in the regional game or the local club game uh, as a broadcaster. And it was really about being in the right place at the right time. I had transferred from the Trinidad Guardian newspaper to Radio Trinidad. And, and as it turned out, uh, uh, Dave Lamy, who I had mentioned, he was on his way uh, to, to another media opportunity. And that created a window uh, for me to, to take advantage of. And, and it really was uh, a bit of luck, a bit of talent, and a really uh, a mixture of both and taking advantage of it. Yeah. It is great fun there, and there is that the, the, the politics, like it is in all the Caribbean and the different countries and so on. It's there, it's there in the radio commentary. You've got to have someone from each particular country, having to make sure that the home country is represented, and and so on. That all of that goes on on a certainly on a on an England cricket tour that I'm aware of, and I pop into the into the local box. You know, you can just, it's just tinkering away under the surface, isn't it? It's, it's not tinkering under under the surface at all. It's right there in your face. I mean, the, <laughs> the stories you can, I, yeah, the stories you can tell, I guess. I mean, I, I would travel in, in the, those early years, was having started in 1992. You'd travel at your own expense to, to get opportunities to do commentary elsewhere in, in the Caribbean chain. And I remember doing a match in Montserrat, the very last first-class match wow. played in Montserrat in 1994 before the volcano, the Lance of Friere, properly uh, uh, erupted and destroyed much of the southern half of the island. Uh, and as, as it turned out, uh, there was a real inter-island rivalry. If you, if you could think of it, that being intense among the islands, imagine what it's like in the Leeward Islands or yeah. the Windward Islands, where they were, they were really upset that there was no native of Montserrat in the Leeward Islands team prior <laughs> to that match. So what the authorities did, they named Lesroy Weeks, the West Indies under-19 fast bowler in the squad of 13. The crowd turned up and he was promptly left out of the final 11. And in protest, all of the commentators abandoned the commentary box (laughs) in protest, leaving me and an Englishman who was there doing some development work with some UNDP, whatever it is, doing commentary for four days by ourselves. And if that wasn't funny, he confused the six foot seven inch Tony Gray with a five foot something Rajendra Danraj <laughs> and could not identify them. And I and I tried to took the paper it over. I was saying yes, they're both wearing helmets and it's difficult <laughs> to discern them. But it, it was an absolute riot. But that oh. gives you a, a sense of, of the politics. What a great story. Whatever happened to Les Roy? Do we know? <laughs> Did he ever make it or not? <laughs> He, he played a couple of matches, but never really got the opportunity to, to properly develop. But uh, I, I mean, the, the intensity of, of, of those feelings, the, the, 
they, they have never diminished, even as the West Indies' fortunes would have declined so precipitously uh, over the decades. That intensity is still there. You'd still sit in a taxi in Bridgetown and only hear about Barbados players. You'll, see, you'll, you'll be in the market in Grenada and you'll think that every single Grenadian cricketer deserves to be picked ahead of everyone else. That's yeah. just the way it is. It is. I, I was there in Barbados for the first match against South Africa when there wasn't a Barbadian playing. Uh, Jimmy, no Cummins, no Goins. Anderson Cummins, the one Bayesian who might have played, they left him out and no one went to the game. And it was a terrific game of cricket, of course, with the West Indies winning on the last day when it looked as if South Africa were going to win. And I'd go back to the hotel every night and the waiters would be there wanting to know what the score was. And that was it. And they boycotted, they boycotted the match. Yeah, and, and I, again, it, it is a, a really emotive place when it comes to cricket. I recall Derek Murray uh, being left out of the West Indies team for the first time in, in several years for a tour of Pakistan and then for the following series against England. And uh, there were protests outside the ground. Uh, <laughs> someone poured oil on the pitch. Uh, it delayed the start of the match. And, and, it, and you had a committee being formed, the Committee in Defence of West Indies Cricket, led by trade unionists and so on. It all gets very proper and very formal and so on. So it's not something to be taken lightly. And if you pretend to take it lightly, you, you, you really get to get the, the thin end of the, of the wedge very, yeah. very easily. So you really are walking a tightrope. And, and we will talk about Tony Cozier properly now. But did you... I mean, he was, he was, he must be such a big influence on you, I guess, Fazio. But did you try and copy him? Did you deliberately not try and copy him? What did, what did you learn from Tony? I, I think I, I learned uh, a, a lot as far as just sitting side by side with him when I actually got into the, into, into the business as, as a journalist and a broadcaster, uh, just chatting with him about the game. And, and, and as you said correctly, listening to him and, and not just listening to Tony Cozier, but listening to all of the big names. The first series that really caught my ear was 1975-76 in Australia. And just as an 11-year-old, the fascination of hearing someone saying, well, it's a lovely, glorious, sunny morning here at Melbourne for the Boxing Day Test Match, 90,000 people there. And it's pitch black in the Caribbean because it's in the middle of the night. And it just seemed to be a totally different world. And to hear those pictures being painted by Alan McGilvery and, and hmm. Tony and, and so many others. It, it just seemed fascinating. And it, it was about not so much copying Tony or copying John Arlott or anyone else, but just trying to find your own voice, but understanding that these were the gentlemen who set the standard that you should try to emulate. Yeah, and very traditional. I mean, he, he, he gave me really, I think, possibly the only real commentary lesson that I ever had in that he sat me down my, my very first year and said, right, because West Indies were here in 91 when I started. And he said, you always start with the run-up. Bowlers running in. Then you have the bowler bowls. And you have to say, if you can, the batsman's name there. So, the, so Jones bowls to Smith. And Smith does that. So the, so the focus changes onto the batsman. So if Smith is then bowled, Smith is then caught. Smith plays a beautiful cover drive or something. You've totally established the batsman and, and what he's doing. It's not just a case of the bowler bowls and there's a scream of bowled him or something. He was he was so regimented into getting that absolutely basic but essential timing right. So you get the picture of what's happening. And uh, I remember very clearly him sitting me down and telling me that. Richards gets a full toss and hits a six. Over square leg. Full toss. Richards, 138, not out. And of course... Tony was 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 so welcomed on 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 Test Match Special. He just seemed to fit as 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 you do, Fazir. I mean, did you find it uh, a little bit intimidating when he first appeared on Test Match Special? Very intimidating because I mean, here I here I am. No, I think it might have been the 1999 World Cup uh, when I got the opportunity uh, uh, to to do some some commentary there to actually be in the same environment of so many of the great voices in the game. So it was tremendously intimidating, but also very welcoming. I mean, everyone one around, yourself and so many others uh, in, involved in, in the team made you feel very, very welcome. But it was tremendously in, intimidating. And, and remember, I would have, have to be aspiring to this post for a long time. And as brutal as it will sound, I had to wait for Tony Cozier to no longer be around to get the opportunity. Uh, because, I mean, who replaces Tony Cozier? No one. And, and even in late 60s into his 70s, he was still the distinctive voice of West Indies cricket. So I, I had to, to wait my turn. And, and that only 
created greater levels of anxiety. But I have to say, when you finally settle down and realize that it's just a bunch of mates enjoying the game, describing the game, ensuring that you're as professional as possible, but still having quite a bit of fun, it's been a thoroughly uh, engaging and wonderful experience. Well, you're pretty relaxed at Headingley in 2017, Fazia, because you gave us a touch of Calypso. A lovely day for cricket, blue skies and gentle breeze. The Indians are waiting now to play the West Indies. A signal from the umpire, play is about to start. Here comes uh, Chase. <laughs> As he bowls to Milan and he's playing it back along the pitch. The Indians come out on the field. They all look very smart. Irapali Prasanna, Gigi Boyan Wadeka, Krishnamurti and Vishnu Mankad. Them boys could well play cricket on any kind of wicket. They make the West Indies team look so bad. We were in all sorts of trouble. Joey Carew, he pull a muscle. Clive Lloyd get about three run out. We were in trouble without a doubt. It was Gavaska, the <laughs> real master. As Chase comes in again, <laughs> bowls outside the off stuff and lets it go by through to the keeper. The real master, just like a wall, they couldn't out Gavaskar at all. Not at all. You know, the West Indies couldn't out Gavaskar at all. 146 for three. <laughs> can, you, can, can you believe you did that? You know, I just wanted to put down my microphone and leave after that because I knew <laughs> I could never match that at any other point in my, my broadcasting career. <laughs> We talked about change, though, and actually it was at Queen's Park uh, some time ago now. What was the year when the Jamaica Test match was cancelled and we had two staged at uh, Trinidad instead? We're going back well into the 90s now. But anyway, I remember Peter Baxter producing then said to me, how are we going to make this second test match here at the same ground back to back sound different and i said well i've been working next door on the commercial station locally here with a woman called donna simmons and there's been all this talk about when will the first woman ever appear on test match special and everything else i said i reckon she's she's absolutely perfect for it she's she's the one a to break the mold and to establish that actually women can commentate just as equally well as men can and, I th and, and, and she's good enough. And I said, just check with Vic Marks, who's actually sort of working alongside her. I was just listening to her sort of five minutes at the takeovers and so on. And so it was there at Queen's Park where the first woman commentated on Test Match Special. It was Donna uh, and she was working in the next door box. And now, happily, thanks to the example that she's set, we've got many more women commentating on the game. Here is Fraser. He's on his way. He's over the wicket, bowling to the left-handed Clayton Lambert. And Clayton Lambert has hit this high in the air. He should be out now. Headley's coming under it and will take the catch. Yes, he does. He falls in the process. His elbows go on the ground, but he takes the catch. And Clayton Lambert has been dismissed as he was looking to hook that through mid-wicket. And the ball going high in the air, taken by Headley, a running catch from mid-on. That was that was 1998. Uh, that that, was that, that series uh, that, that that you referred to, I, and indeed, uh, I first heard Donna, and the, the first time I actually travelled out of Trinidad uh, to to do coverage it wasn't radio; it was writing for the Trinidad Guardian newspaper. 1987 at Kensington Nova, and I heard this this female voice, and, and again, it sounds all pretty chauvinistic now, of course, but you're almost taken aback by a female voice. Uh, talking cricket, but she, she knew her stuff. She, she's always known her stuff. And and, and I'll have to, to, to acknowledge that she really had to endure yeah. lots of snide, snide but remarks must, and, I mean, and for, comments. It must, and, it must have been terrible. I mean, the chauvinism at the time, in, it, it was such a male-dominated sport, wasn't it? It was unbelievable. And I, I'll have to say that while I, I didn't participate in it, Cowardly, I didn't, I didn't dis discourage it because I was trying to to make my own way, and I just simply saw it as competition and, and, and whatever it was. But really, some of it was really terrible. It, it was unbearable to hear the comments being made about someone who was just doing her job to the best of her ability and doing a very good job at it as well. Yeah, I've got a, hu a huge amount of respect for, for for Donna for for the way she did that, and then of course, but yes, for yes, for being a, a bit of a trailblazer. Now, look, we can't talk to you, Fazio, there in Trinidad, without talking about. Uh, is he still the king of Trinidad? I guess he is. Uh, one Brian Charles Lara. Um, are you a fan? I mean, how did you how did you cope with commentating? Given again, we go back to you know, how sort of tightly and intimate your countries are with one another, how proud you are of, of, of your own space, your own country and so on. How did you manage to commentate impartially on Brian Lara? 
I'll have to say that it wasn't that difficult because I actually, I would, it wouldn't be correct to say I grew up with Brian because we're four years apart, but we were, we were both at the Queen's Park Cricket Club. Um, and we actually were at the crease a couple of times together playing for the Queen's Park seconds and so on before. Of course, he shot onto the first team and then Trinidad and Tobago and, and West Indies and so on. But even with that proximity, I am one of the few in my profession, certainly in my part of the world, that I was liberated from that fear of, of, of criticism and being replaced or get being gotten rid of because I didn't support my own and so on, because I had the benefit of another profession, which is our family business. We're in the electrical business. We've been involved in that business for some 50 years. And my brother always reminds me that this pretense of boldness and impartiality <laughs> and speaking my mind and not being afraid to criticize a Brian Lara or criticize a Phil Simmons to the point where he banned me from interviewing the team on the tour of Australia oh, in 2015. <laughs> that that alleged bravery is only because I've got another job to fall back <laughs> on. And, and he said the day that they decide to fire me as a director from the family business, he wants to hear me speak as boldly as I would <laughs> normally on air. So, so it, it never really was an issue, Agus. I always, yeah. and, and I had that argument many times with colleagues on air and off air because I never saw my job as I'm a cheerleader for Trinidad Tobago or the West Indies or Brian Lara or anybody else, which is why Kyron Pollard can make a comment when I introduced him in that flattering manner sure. as to wondering whether it was a case of mistaken identity. Zalara drives in the air and he's caught at extra cover and just as we were talking about Lara playing uh, with increasing freedom and wanting to get a, a useful innings, he gives it away driving at a delivery that he was never really to the pitch of and offering a simple catch uh, to Hasibol Hussein at extra cover. Because it, it was difficult with Brian, it must have been, because he was, he, he, you know, he was a controversial figure, wasn't he? And, and you know, was he a good captain? I think many people will say he, that actually his management skills were appalling and that, that, that a, lot of the, a lot of the issues surrounding West Indies cricket when he was in charge were, were, were down to him. But it, you know, whether you believe that or not, it's, it's, it's up to you. But it can't have been easy within Trinidad to have been critical of Brian Lara. It wouldn't have been easy, but you've got to tell yourself, you know, that there's something more important than saying the popular things, Agas. And in fact, for, for a number of years, I've been doing a column in the Trinidad Express newspaper, started in 2005. And I, I remember one of the early ones I wrote uh, after he had had a fantastic series in Pakistan, turned out to be his last test series, uh, because he left shortly after with the World Cup in 2007. And, and, and the headline was, great batsman, poor leader. Ah. And the, the comments I got about that, I was shellacked from, <laughs> from pillar to post. Oh, How dare I say that about the Prince of Port of Spain? What sort of trini am I? Mm. Uh, is it because I'm an East Indian and I don't like the African element because mm. there's also the politics that's tied into it? But I, for, quite frankly, I couldn't be bothered uh, <laughs> because uh, you're, you're, the, the numbers are there. He's a poor leader uh, because he just was so enveloped in his his worth as a batsman. Yeah. Is he still around? Do you see him around? You ha Well, actually, I, I, I've seen him around a lot more over the last couple of years because he's actually patronised our business doing some refurbishment on, on his home up, up at Lady Chancellor Hill. Oh, uh, but he spent so much... Yeah, so, so you're up there. So, <laughs> no, I, I actually went... The first time I actually went up there, Agus, was just a couple months ago to collect a check from his sister because oh. he's somewhere in India or some other part of the world with some work that, that, that we had done and, and so on on the electricals at his home. Uh, but yeah, it was the very first time I had <laughs> gone up to the home because it's maybe something about my character, but I just never want to be seen as one of those hangers on. Yeah. One who would say, well, you know, I was at Brian Lara's home and I sat at his table and had dinner with him. Really couldn't be bothered because I think that sort of proximity creates some difficulty when you've got to say it as it is. Yeah. The, the politics of, of, of your part of the world always intrigues me, Fazir. In that really robust, incredibly powerful West Indies team, we've talked about it from 83 to the, the mid-90s and so on, it was largely Afro-Caribbean, wasn't it? And you had your Roman Canhais and others who, who, who were there sort of passing through. Then it seemed as if there was a real switch down south, down to your part of the world, where it was actually a much more 
uh, sort of Asian influence and the whole the, the actual style of cricket seemed to change as well. More spin bowlers, uh, slower pitches and so on. And there was talk of the Afro-Caribbeans and the North, the fast bowlers, rather turning their back on the game and, and going off and, and doing other things. But now, having seen, of course, our last summer here, it looks as if it's sort of switched back again and it's big, fast bowlers. Do, do you sense that over there? You know, it's, it's always interesting, Agus, when we hear these uh, different perspectives. Uh, we, we, we've heard it for decades about we've lost so much talent to U.S. basketball and, and other U.S. sports and so on. The thing is, and I'm sure you've been, been to the Caribbean so many times, but even then, it's difficult to get a real handle on what the Caribbean is all about. It's a mixture of races, a mixture of ideologies, a mixture of political perspectives. It, 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 we ha always have to remind people when we, we talk about the UK or Scotland, England, Wales, and those sorts of rivalries, just multiply that many times over when you talk about the identity of our Caribbean territories and the issues which, which sometimes take over. And, and in, in reference to your to the, the likes of a, a Darren Ganga, a Dinanath Ramnarain, a Dinesh Ramdin, a Ramnari Sarwan, a Shivnarain Chandapur, yes. uh, you, you have a West Indies team where you have five players or six players, all of East Indian descent, when previously you'd hardly seen any one of them. That might have had to do with the pitches because for a long time, the pitches were very tired, very lifeless. But it also has to be said that we were in a trough of complacency for a very long time, almost convincing ourselves that this was all some global conspiracy to beat West Indies cricket down, not realizing that we just simply took our eyes off the ball and were so complacent believing we'd always produce these great cricketers that we didn't put the work in. And now you're seeing these young fast bowlers, the Shamar holders and so many others come to the fore. You've got the veteran like Kimar Roach who did his damage to England last year, that they've always been around, but it's been sort of taken for granted. Now, finally, you're seeing the work being put in and they are coming to the fore once again. Okay, so it might be a situation where players of East Indian descent might seem to be pushed out, but I don't see it that way. I think whoever are your best players, whether they be all East Asian, Chinese, African, whatever it might be, uh, and there will always be though that, that complicated mix that you've got to get. But because of the, the, the way the Caribbean is, you're always going to have so many players of African descent dominating the team simply because they, they are the majority in the population. Yes. And Jason Holder, you know, what, what an incredible young man I think he is. The stick that he had and must have had from throughout the Caribbean when he was such a young man when he got that very difficult job. But I have to say, last summer and actually before that, on the tour of the last tour of the Caribbean, as a visitor and as, a t as a someone who doesn't see your team that often, you can really see some big steps in progress being made now. And that must encourage you. Well, the, the fact that he's still in the job uh, is a testament to him. Because, as you said, the abuse that he would have had to take on, whatever you got there uh, in the international news wires or the reporting or whatever, just, just multiply that at least 10, 15 times yeah. to understand that everywhere you go as Jason Holder in a struggling West Indies team uh, with the Dave Cameron presidency of Cricket West Indies and all the controversy attached to that as well, being accused as Darren Sammy was previously of being a yes man to the board and that, oh, you're, you're from Barbados and you know Barbadians are, are normally happy to bow down to the, to the white massa and all that sort of thing, all of that attached to it. Yet at the end of it all, you, you see him now, uh, uh, someone who's confident of his skills as a cricketer, as a leader, uh, as, as someone who can deal with any issue that comes up in the media and so on. I, I think he's, he's advanced way beyond his years simply because of what he had to endure here in the Caribbean. Yeah. And are you positive, Fazir, about you're going to be commentating on some, on, on some good times for, for the West Indies in the future? Not really all that positive. I, I, maybe That's so West Indies. Because... That is so Caribbean, Fazir. <laughs> that is so Caribbean. <laughs> I suppose, I suppose it is, but I mean, what, on what do we base the optimism? Uh, because yeah, won the first test match at, at Southampton, but then capitulated so badly in the remaining test matches. And then you hear the same old excuses uh, being thrown up, maybe for the T20s, because that seems to be our natural game. Mm. And that might even make it that much more difficult in the test game to really build our focus once again. But you, you live in hope because that famous victory at Headingley, the win at Southampton, beating Pakistan a couple of times, once in Sharjah. So there are more encouraging signs now 
But I, I still think that because so many of our players gravitate towards T20, that is now an additional challenge when you're trying to keep players, young players especially, focused on test cricket. So it's going to be tough for a while still. Well, look, before you go, um, what's, what's your uh, career highlight been? I wonder if for England listeners, you're on air for a very special moment uh, in 2017 that we can hear now. Anderson bowls to Bathroom. Bowling! That's number 500 for Jimmy Anderson. The first Englishman to reach the landmark. It's taken maybe a bit longer than you would have anticipated. But Jimmy Anderson has reached 500 in Test cricket. The first to do so. A tremendous performance from the Lancastrian. 500 Test wickets. Great stuff. What a moment. Have you got a particular favourite, Fazia? I, I suppose when, when you think about it, uh, Brian Lara famously winning a test match for the West Indies in Barbados when the, the West Indies chased down 311. He got 153. The West Indies winning by one wicket. And there have been quite a, a, a few tremendous finishes. But just on, on, on that situation with the Jimmy Anderson, you get very nervous because you know there's a moment of history coming yes. up. And because you're a West Indian, you don't want to mess it up. You don't want to make an absolute of, of, of something that that surely is, is going to be repeated over and over again as well, so that people will say, who is this fool that making a mess of this tremendous historic moment? So you do get a bit anxious, but I think it, it helps that you grow up in the game and you realise that there, there are bigger issues than just your narrow West Indian perspective and, 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 and it helps to, to really capture a moment like that. 